Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Real Estate Red Zone, brought to you by the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University. I'm Haley Reeder, Communications Specialist. Thanks for tuning in. Today is Thursday, June 13th, 2019. On this day in 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the $25 million appropriations bill for the Naval Air Station in Corpus Christi. Construction began on June 30th, and the dedication was held on March 12, 1941. The station at Flower Bluff eventually occupied 20,000 acres across three counties. It initially trained naval pilots, navigators, gunners, and radio operators. In 2001, the base served as home to several Navy commands, including the Chief of Naval Air Training. It seems like everywhere you go, Texas is covered in orange traffic cones, silver scaffolding, and roaring construction machinery. Development across the state has been booming, and there are no signs of that momentum halting anytime soon. In its most basic form, development is adding value to land. However, it can quickly become a pretty complicated process. Behind a development is a large team of professionals. Architects, contractors, city planners, and more all pitch in to make their project a success. But according to today's guest, the developers become the quarterback of a project team, coordinating their efforts and hopefully leading their team to a development touchdown. Dr. Russ Peterson is a clinical assistant professor of finance at the Master of Real Estate program in Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. He's also the director of the BBA program in finance. He joins us today to talk about what it takes to get into development and how education and data analysis can help developers reduce risk. So first, what's your background? I uh, went to the University of Texas, graduated with an economics degree, came here to Texas A&M, got a master's in real estate, stuck around for a PhD Mm -hmm. in uh, urban regional science so I could learn some of the built environment planning along with the finance and economics. So it's been a comprehensive view of real estate. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you got it kind of from every angle there. Yes. And you're in it academically, but you also are involved in real estate development as well, right? I um, have been involved mm-hmm. with pre-development uh, and have my broker's license, actually. So it's been fun, but I've been primarily teaching for the uh, last uh, few years. And it's been a real joy to be with these uh, Texas a students. So what I have my students do, one of the first assignments to describe themselves and uh, a uh, piece of real estate that really has meant a lot to them in their lives. And uh, just to get that context of real estate is a part of our lives and uh, really does have uh, meaningful moments that we have either at ranches or homes or lake houses. Uh, And there's just so much that we can learn from real estate and it can be a really uh, great asset to uh, grow wealth with. Yeah. So it really shows, yeah, just how This physical object can have so much more meaning than that. What would you pick if you had to pick a piece of real estate that meant something to you? Well, I'd say it was my grandfather's ranch in Round Rock, Texas, Mm -hmm. right off Gattisville Road. It's now uh, a lot of pavement and homes, but -hmm. just so many memories with family and uh, just learning how to to fish and just yeah, kicking dirt, walking through the woods, and it was just just amazing. So many family mm-hmm. memories there. Memories there, and I'd say the students. The number one response I get is uh, Kyle Field. Oh wow! <laughs> so that is very popular. Mm-hmm. And our the Aggie Barn in between uh, College Station and Waco. Yes, pass that get every that time I go to Dallas. Eiffel Tower. Yeah. So some of those are pretty interesting. That is interesting. So what does it take to enter into not just academic real estate, but also just the real estate development industry? I've gotten the privilege of being around so many amazing developers that they've uh, come and shared with our students, allowed us to work on projects with them. And I have noticed a few characteristics of developers, if you don't mind me sharing. Go for it, yeah. Uh, these uh, developers uh, have vision. They have these light bulb ideas as uh, they know markets and, and 
I'm reminded of uh, Bill Schoen and Kit Goldsberry in San Antonio who developed Pearl Brewery, redeveloped rather, and it was a really dilapidated blight area that uh, they had vision for and have transformed downtown San Antonio in a tremendous way Yeah, by having vision and the ter- determination to, to uh, stick with that vision. And uh, it does take determination as a developer. It takes patience. I know uh, Midway Companies with Brad Friels and uh, Jonathan Princeton, they, uh, so many wonderful people there. They started working on a project here at, uh, in College Station uh, on property that A&M owned. And they uh, presented a proposal in 2005 to develop on some A&M land. And it, uh, in 2017, their development started functioning and they are still in process of uh, finishing it out, but it's a tremendous uh, development, Century Square. If you yeah. haven't been there, it's just beautiful. But 2005 to 2017, quite a number of years, takes patience, mm-hmm. determination uh, in many cases. And like I said earlier, uh, knowledge of so many disciplines. Mm-hmm. So uh, it is probably the number one interest of our students uh, as far as their desires for their career to be a, a developer mm-hmm. but it's very hard very very difficult yeah and uh but doable just be sure and uh educate yourself up development is creating value so if you happen to have uh, a piece of land and you can subdivide it sell it off in pieces that can be creating value mm-hmm. uh but it does get very complex fast yeah so if you're going to have an HEB anchored uh, center, retail center. Uh, It's going to be good good for you to know about the financials behind that and uh, so many uh, so many details as you move up to Apple moving their office or having an office presence in Austin. Mm -hmm. That's going to be you don't know if they're going to do a skyscraper or a ground scraper in North Austin. It's very complex. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have folks that, that aren't educated who can be very successful. But I always say to uh, my students that uh, you can minimize risk through education and knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I've needed all the help I can get. So I stuck yeah. around for a PhD <laughs> and uh, still need help. But it does minimize risk to really, uh, yeah, learn about these uh, different facets to development. Um, because developers become quarterbacks of a project team. And so they have to know a little bit about, uh, architecture, engineering, uh, construction. Uh, they need to know about banking, lending, investors. Uh, they need to work with city planners, fire marshals. Uh, they have to deal with neighbors, uh, for the project, Uh, marketing, branding experts, lawyers. So... It is pretty comprehensive, and it's really nice if you can uh, get knowledge about those different different aspects of development. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you're also talking about analyzing data. That's obviously very important to not just real estate development, but real estate in general. So what kind of data should a successful developer really be looking at? I get to teach a class called Market Analysis for Development, and... Yeah, market analysis, market data is so vital to successful development. And uh, good market analysis can really uh, mean the difference between failure and huge success. I tell our students, junk in, junk out. Mm -hmm. If uh, you don't have accurate data or old data and you put uh, that into your financials, that could really throw your project off and and hurt you financially. So... uh, I start off with our class uh, discussing economic base analysis that jobs mm-hmm. are the basis for growth in a city and in a submarket. So keep an eye on jobs. Are you going to have job growth? Are you going to have job loss? Yeah. And different types of jobs, 
basic industry jobs versus non-basic industry jobs, kind of like export, uh, export-based businesses versus uh, support industry jobs. So you want that growth. You want Apple to be coming to your community if you are developing, and mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of potential growth there, or Toyota in the Dallas area. Right. And so that's the basics. Uh, follow the jobs. And then in our class, we discuss fundam fundamental markets, and that can also be called space markets versus capital markets. Mm -hmm. in, our, in our fundamental markets, we're looking at supply and demand. Yes. We're looking at vacancy rates, rental rates, absorption rates, pipeline and new construction. And then with our capital markets, we're trying to figure out what cap capitalization rates uh, commercial properties are selling for, basically what are the values of properties, um, discount rates or required rates of return of investors, lending rates. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically cost of capital in the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those the uh, capital markets and fundamental markets act very differently. And so I really emphasize to our students to keep an eye on the fundamental markets. Uh, so keep an eye on supply versus demand because eventually the pricing will, will uh, revert to the fundamental markets. For instance, here in College Station, if we happen to have uh, oversupply of student housing, mm -hmm. our pricing are uh, the prices being paid for apartment complexes, student student housing complexes may really be high when we're seeing that uh, the first uh, signs of danger when we have too many beds yeah. for students. So it may take some time uh, before the pricing takes effect and catches up with our fundamental market. Mm -hmm. So we get into those kind of details with data and I, and I encourage investors and developers to keep an eye on the fundamentals and uh i tell our students i encourage them to go cia on their submarkets yeah i mean uh, <laughs> like the central intelligence agency gather information knowledge differentiates you so if uh that means driving through neighborhoods if you're doing residential development uh Look in, drive around your area, look for, for sale signs, for lease signs. If you're in apartments in the, during the week, night, go look for lights that are on, maybe from the parking lot to see mm -hmm. how many dark spaces there are. Uh, go interview self-storage, uh, I guess you could say employees to ask what occupancy rates there are if you're developing self-storage and mm -hmm. really hit the pavement and that can differ differentiate the knowledge uh, that you have and give you a competitive advantage. Uh, so we look at data from the real estate center, which mm -hmm. we're very fortunate to have the Texas a and Real Estate Center in Texas. So Texas developers, that's a huge asset. Look at citydata.com, Reese, CoStar. Uh, our students work with business analysts, do some GIS applications with data, uh, the appraisal district, getting uh, property information, uh, being familiar with text dot and future road plans uh, as you're getting into those property specific details, um, following utilities, because it's really important that utilities uh, access close to your project, mm -hmm. follow school expansions. Uh, so a lot of a lot of data is out there, and so much so that it is uh, really a task to zero in on the key data that's going to affect your project, mm -hmm. and to be able to tell bankers, investors a good story with that data. Yeah. So that's that takes a, a lot of effort because it's one thing to get uh, market analysis where you get a lot of information thrown at you but not deciphered for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to train our students to decipher through that data and tell a good story and have a good justification for development. And a lot of developers have amazing gut feelings, the intuitions of what is going to work. And uh, my challenge is, is to quantify that gut yeah. with data. And that minimizes risk. That's interesting. And you were kind of touching on different points of different, you know, commercial real estate sectors, like, you know, and how they really work together. 
So how do these different kinds of commercial real estate, you know, affect the residential market? Like, for instance, office development could signal increased residential development as more people are moving in for jobs, um, but they need to find housing, etc. So how do they really work together and what should you really be paying attention to in those cases? That's a great question. And I kind of see it the opposite with our Texas markets and suburbia that a lot of times commercial follows residential. Interesting. So we'll have uh, retailers uh, that will want to locate outside of a city or in the growing areas of a city uh, when there are a certain number of rooftops in that area. Interesting. And so we've seen these suburban uh, office buildings that, that pop up uh, to be convenient for folks that are living in suburbia. Yeah. And retail centers will follow those rooftops, and it adds convenience for those living further out. But there are layers in that process. So, sure, when you have jobs, uh, you're going to need office buildings, and we've seen that historically in downtown areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we originally had retail in the downtown areas, and as our uh, economies have expanded and you know, with technologies like cars and we've had bypasses, uh, we've seen those downtowns kind of cut off a little bit mm -hmm. and that's suburbia still, still growing out there. But I like to keep an eye on homes and, uh, I think they're more of a predictor of what's going to happen with commercial. So if we see a slowdown in housing, I think, uh, yeah, it's good to be ex expecting a slowdown in commercial, uh, real estate. That's interesting that you mentioned that it reminds me of metros like McKinney, you know, that they, I felt like people really started moving in there and then, yeah, the commercial kind of followed out there. Now McKinney's not that little town it used to be anymore. It's big. And then there's a fancy term for that mm -hmm. new uh, city or that growing city an edge city, not just edge a, city. yeah, not just suburbia, but an edge city. And they start to get an economic base, those smaller towns outside the big, big cities. And then they have an, another a new term, pretty new term. It's called exurbia. Mm -hmm. So instead of suburbia, you have exurbia, the suburbia of suburbia. Yeah. So now, do you have any tips for people trying to become uh, a developer, or just in general for real estate professionals or students? Uh, well, I always advise uh, if you can take real estate classes, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. That's what I did. I'm kind of biased towards that. And we have so many amazing real estate programs in the state of Texas. Uh, and A&M is one of those. So, uh, but there, we have access to so much information online and uh, through our real estate commission, Texas Real Estate Commission, we can take courses and learn about real estate. Uh, so I do encourage folks to if they're going to get into development to really educate up and to keep it simple, mm -hmm. the KISS principle, yes. if you're doing development, I say uh, keep it simple, silly, because uh, I'm always around my kids. But <laughs> uh, yeah, that if uh, you have to really be complex to make a project work or stretch uh, anticipated rent, it can get a bit dangerous. Right. So, uh, try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, quantify your, your gut feelings or your intuitions cause they may be great, but, uh, yeah, quantify it with, with data. And uh, I always tell my students, don't just follow the herd like cattle going through a ranch and following a rut mm -hmm. in the land. Uh, yeah, sometimes those cattle get led to slaughter and, uh, <laughs> It's nice to have your head up and you get your, uh, when you're, when you have your head up, you can see what's going on in the economy. And so I encourage our students to read the wall street journal, to read, uh, local newspapers in the areas that, that they're, uh, working in and, uh, all kinds of business journals so that they're aware of what's coming down the pike, that they can make educated decisions in a timely manner. Right. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on. Really enjoyed talking to you today. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here, Haley. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Russ Peterson from Mays Business School. 
We posted a link to more information about Dr. Peterson on our podcast webpage and in the YouTube description box. If you're looking for some reliable data to bolster your real estate knowledge, check out the center's website. Under our data tab, we have information on housing activity and affordability, our home price index, rural land, building permits, employment, and population. Also, our Texas quarterly commercial report has recently been updated. You can get first quarter 2019 data on office, retail, and warehouse space in Austin, Dallas-Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston, plus a 2019 commercial real estate forecast. Check out the report for all that, and don't forget to subscribe to email notifications so you always know when a new installment of the report is released. We also have email subscriptions for our four monthly economic reports. They discuss different facets of the Texas economy, including border economic health, statewide housing market data, employment, and general economic well-being. We posted a link to our research library, which includes all that, on our podcast webpage. The research library is also home to all of the articles in the upcoming Tierra Grande magazine. If you can't wait for the July issue to hit your mailbox, head online to read the articles before the magazine is published. Topics include flood protection technology, homeownership affordability, the effects of subprime lending, estate planning tools, development in Waco, and real estate disputes. That's going to be it for today's podcast. If you want more from the Real Estate Center, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You can also check out our website. That's www.recenter.tamu.edu for the latest data, research articles, blogs, news, and more. Thanks for joining us today in the Real Estate Red Zone. Brought to you by the Real Estate Center in College Station, Texas, where we've been helping developers build successful projects since 1971. This is Haley Reeder, signing out. See you next time, and happy Father's Day. Bye!